I'm Beth Haynes, and I am the founder of the Black Ribbon Project. In fact, I am the Black Ribbon Project. <laughs> it pretty much it just is in a box in my house. But I want this to grow. Um, it came about because the passage of Obamacare sent me into a period of very deep discouragement and hopelessness and feelings of powerlessness. And when I came up with this idea, it gave me something to do. Because as you've heard through many of the fabulous talks that we've had here today about why it's wrong from an economic point of view and it's wrong from a medical point of view, it's wrong from a moral point of view, not enough people know that. A lot of what I was going to say I've been ripping out because it's been said and I'm realizing you guys know half the stuff I was going to say anyway. Some of it I'm going to say just because I want you to give me money and I need you to know what I stand for. But what I want to offer is this symbol of the black ribbon as um, counting for we are in support of healthcare freedom and we're in support of the doctor-patient relationship. Because a lot of, there was a lot of discussion that went on ahead of the voting for the bill that had to do with some very important issues, things like rising health care costs, increasing number of uninsured, and the impending insolvency of Medicare and Medicaid. But I think what was lost and what should have been front and center was how that law and how these health care policies are going to affect the doctor-patient relationship and the practice of medicine. And this is, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But the fact that this was not central to the discussion is no accident. We heard um, from Dr. Watson that we are at war. And I don't know who said this, but somebody at one point said, if people had read Mein Kampf and took Hitler si seriously, we, would, we could have saved ourselves maybe World War II. Well, I think we need to read Donald Berwick. And from his new rules, you'll find out why what's happening to the doctor-patient relationship is happening. And let me quote from, from his book. Today, and he's referring to the doctor-patient relationship, today this isolated relationship is no longer tenable or possible. Traditional medical ethics based on the doctor-patient dyad must be reformulated to fit the new mold of the delivery of health care. Regulation must evolve. Regulating for improved medical care involves designing appropriate rules with authority. And I think we know who he thinks the authority should be. Health care is being rationalized through critical pathways and guidelines. The primary function of regulation in health care, especially as it affects quality of medical care, is to constrain decentralized individualized decision-making. The law that has been written is absolutely intended to destroy the doctor-patient relationship, which means it's out to destroy the whole purpose of medicine, because you and I know the purpose of medicine is to take care of that individual patient. So the purpose of the Black Pro Ribbon Project is to have a means, a symbol, around which we can recenter the debate to the doctor-patient relationship and its importance to having quality, meaningful health care. I'm passionate about my beliefs, and although my family and close friends won't believe this, it is hard for me to speak up. I don't like foisting my ideas upon anybody else. But if I wear this symbol, I'm inviting somebody to ask me about it, and then I'm a little bit more comfortable speaking up. Ribbons have become a big part of standing up for a cause in our country. I think everybody knows yellow ribbons is for support our troops. And that pink ribbons is going to be against the fight for, uh, is going to be for fighting breast cancer. I want the black ribbon, or as you can see that I have a white ribbon, <laughs> I want that to symbolize the fight for healthcare freedom and for quality medicine through the doctor-patient relationship. I want it to go viral. I want you to help me make this a nationalized, recognized symbol to invite people to talk out, to make it possible for you to start talking to people easily. And we need, we need to make this talk about freedom of choice, not just for medical choices, but also financial choices. And that's where this health care bill comes in with take, putting the mandates 
strangling our practices. Because without freedom of choice, we can't work for the, the benefit of the individual patient. We do need to address the economic problems. They're real. But we need to do it in a way that does not trample the central purpose of medicine. And that means to be able to care for, be care, able to care for the whole patient. When I was in medical school and residency, treating the whole patient meant don't just look at an isolated disease. Look at all the different diseases of that patient and how do they interact. And now you also have to think about how this is psychologically affecting them. I think we need to broaden what we consider in the whole patient to also thinking about what the financial situation of our patients are. There was a phrase that, that I came across in, in reading about this that was called, it was, the phrase was, you need to be able to save the widow the farm. And what this brings up to me is an old country doctor sitting in front of a farmer who has just been given a diagnosis of terminal cancer. And that farmer can spend every single cent that he has to try and beat that disease and perhaps live a, bit, live a little bit longer and absolutely impoverish his family and lose the family farm. Or he and his doctor can sit down and look at all of the values that that patient has, including his family, and say, what makes realistic sense, given the resources that you have available to you, to try and fight this disease? That's treating the whole patient. And whose resources can he take use of? Only his own. We can't rightfully have that, na that farmer go and say to his neighbor, you have to fund my fight for cancer, because I'll go bankrupt. You know that. And yet that's exactly what this law does. It, it turns our neighbors into the unwilling means to someone else's ends. That is not compassion. And yet the liberals are, have, have gained the reputation of being the compassionate, compassionate ones. But I've got a bumper sticker for that. Coercion is not compassionate. Okay? I think we need to reclaim that when we fight for the individual patient and we fight for the, our individual ability to practice medicine in the way that, of our own best judgment, we are the ones that are being compassionate. True compassion honors and respects every single individual. A significant part of the problem has become how the discussion nationally is even being taken place. They've shaped the discussion. So what you hear is, we're spending too much of our country's health care resources. They're talking as if these health care resources belong to the nation. Berwick even says it outright, health care is a common good. And if you nationalize health care resources, you can talk about our country spending too much. But once, once you collectivize those resources, you change the measure of success, and you change it away from whether or not you benefit an individual, real living human being, to whether or not you benefit the masses, which means a non-existent statistical average, which is what our sta those standardized protocols are all aimed at. And you lose true efficiency. There's a lot of lip service being given to cost effectiveness. But what is cost effective for the masses is not what is cost effective for the individual. So those are some of the things that we're against. We're against the loss of freedom. We're against the destruction of the doctor-patient relationship. We're against plundering your neighbor for your own purposes, we also need to know what we are for. And the battle for healthcare freedom is part of the larger battle for properly limited government and economic freedom in general. And again, I know you know this. I want you to know that I know it. And one of the things that we need to do is to be able to proudly defend the gloriously moral premise of capitalism. Because capitalism is nothing more than individual rights applied to trade. Capitalism protects the individual against the coercion of another. 
And because of this, capitalism is the perfect model for the doctor-patient relationship. I think Jules demonstrated that beautifully in her talk earlier today. You have mutual respect, you have freedom of choice, you have win-win transactions. One of the mantras I kept hearing from the proponents of Obamacare before it was passed was, we are, the United States is the only country in the world without universal health care. And I wanted to shout out back to them, we're the only country in the world that honored freedom of choice in health care. There was a time when, in our history when we were the only constitutional republic that was founded on the principle of protection of individual rights. We were leaders of the world then. We need to be leaders of the world again, but this time for health care freedom. But we have to be careful that in promoting medicine, we don't undermine the broader principles of economic freedom and of free market capitalism. And there's a lot of things that have been written in the, the literature and the biomedical literature and physicians talking about things which I think we have to be really careful about. And you may not agree with me on this, but I want you to give it some careful consideration. Many times you'll see the question posed, is medicine a business or a profession? Is it a commodity or an altruistic service? I think we can get into some real troubles by claiming that we're a profession and because of that somehow we're superior to other businesses. Now there's no consistent definition that I could find in the medical literature on this, but there was a couple of tenets that occurred quite frequently. First off is that as physicians, we put our patients' interests above our own. And that medicine's primary orientation is as a service rather than for profit. I think these cause some trouble. Because by saying that somehow we're better as a profession, we are improperly denigrating businesses. Properly understood, businesses are a meeting of self-interest. They work towards mutual benefit. That's the essence of capitalism. It's win-win. Nobody trades unless they think they're getting a better deal. Nobody trades voluntarily unless they think they're getting a better deal. And that's true for Walmart. It's true for the local grocery store. It's true for you and I working with our patients. We don't put our interests above the patient, but neither do we need to put the patient's interests above ours. We work together. We're a team. We don't prosper at someone else's expense. That's Marxist way of looking at things. The phrase that I absolutely love that captures this is the harmony of self-interest. And we as physicians prosper best when we meet the self-interests of our patients. And because of that, I think we have to be careful about how hard we come down on profits. Because again, it's an insult to profits. And I think profits are benevolent. Profits are simply the reward somebody earns for successfully offering something that is a value greater than it costs to produce. It's nothing more, it's nothing less. And we're not in it because of the money. We're smart. There's a lot of different things that we could have done. If we wanted to make a lot of money, we wouldn't be physicians. We did it to help people. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong to profit from our valuable work, and we do offer value. We're not exploiting suffering. And people need to understand that, and we need to be able to explain how profits are a moral part of the, the interaction. And in fact, profits are the poor man's best friend. Huge profits are even bigger benefit to the poor man. Because what they do in a free market is they signal and actually invite entrepreneurs and other wealth creators, creators to come in and expand the goods and services in an area of high demand and need. And along those lines, fee-for-service is not the problem. It's gotten a lot of bad um, press. 
And both of the opponents and the proponents of Obamacare are really denigrating fee-for-service. But in a free market of medicine where you have open pricing and competition, the better a physician meets the interest of the patient, the more he or she will prosper. And I also think we have to be careful about saying we're nothing but a service. Because what we're doing when we do that is we invite the government in to just require by law what we're already voluntarily professing is our code of ethics. So it's the harmony of self-interests that makes the free market moral and practical. And it's not fee-for-service, it's not profit-driving, it's the third-party payment system that we're working in that is creating the perverse sort of incentives where people are able to benefit from without paying the cost, by benefit by spending other people's money. And there was a, there's been some mention several times by speakers about the insurance company profits and the outrage, you know, the very large um, amounts of money that some of these CEOs earn. I don't know how to evaluate them in what we have now, because we don't have a free market. If we had a free market, I would say more power to them. That large amount of salary is going to create competition, and we're going to get more people going into it. It's more problematic when we don't have a free system, free market system, and we don't have true insurance. But be careful about how you criticize somebody who's making a lot of money. It's not that they're making money, it's the system within which they are making that money and the way that system is manipulated to allow them to gain money without truly offering value or to offer it with the assistance of the government so it's not truly voluntary. Another argument I hear about having medicine be treated as a free market exchange is that somehow Healthcare is different. Patients are vulnerable. There's an asymmetry of knowledge, that's an economics term, which that just means that because the doctor knows more, they're in a powerful position and, and they are able to take care of, you know, take advantage of the patient. Well, the fact that you become vulnerable when you're sick isn't an argument to go and hobble the person whose judgment you're going to depend on. It is an argument for doing your homework ahead of time and finding and establishing a relationship with a doctor that when you are sick and vulnerable, you can trust to work in your best interest. So I don't think that one cuts it. An asymmetry of knowledge, it's not a flaw in the system. It's the motor of the system. Asymmetry of knowledge is nothing else but specialization and division of labor, and this is the key to wealth creation and prosperity. So I don't buy it. I think medicine is a business. There, it may be that it's a special business because there are intimate aspects of other people's lives that we are privileged to share in a way that they would only share them with people who they are close to. So it's a different kind of relationship than they will have with their grocer or their plumber. But I don't think it's one of kind. I think it's one of degree. Now, there is one system where one man does pr um, prosper at another man's expense, and that is when resources are collectivized, when they're fixed into a commons, a fixed pie, and that's what we have with Obamacare. But it's absolutely false if we have private property and economic freedom with all the wealth-creating, profit-driven interactions, win-win interactions that that consists of. Even gross inequality of wealth, I find, is fundamentally benevolent because it's that excess that is the source of charity. It's that excess that allows for risk-taking and innovation, becomes the funder of, of research and capital formation. And that is the way that we raise the standard of living. And proportionately, the standard of living of the poor will be raised much greater than the, than the standard of living of the rich. And it's even more important because the poor can't do it themselves. They don't have the resources to spare. So inequality of wealth is, is benevolent. I think we have to make the positive case for capitalism in order to fight this, this war of, against Obamacare and against economic lack of freedom. So you know that what 
this black ribbon project is, is one physician offering to one patient the best of his knowledge, advice, and skill, treating that whole patient individually and to mutual advantage as respected partners with the shared goal of achieving that patient's best interest in the most cost-effective way. That's what we do. It's, it's a fabulous thing to be doing for people. But we can't do it if the government gets in and starts micromanaging our practices. Government intervention will change the nature of that relationship and the patients need to know it. It changes it from addressing that individual patient into having to address the healthcare needs of everyone inside and outside of the exam room. It's the mistake of Carl Brandt. And instead of harmony of self-interests, we get the conflict of interests, where it's pitting primary care doctors against specialists. It's pitting patient against patient as they scrabble after the resources of some global budget with rationing of access. It pits the doctor against the hospital as they're trying, who's going to get the bundled payments? How are you going to organize those medical homes and accountable care organizations? It pits the doctor against the patient because you can't care for them if you're trying to dot the I's and follow the regulations that may not even be fitting your patient. So I'd like to recommend that you wear the ribbon Invite inquiry and be prepared to defend freedom, capitalism, and profits, but properly understood. In addition to the ribbon, I've got a couple of other things. So I, you saw my, compassion, my um, coercion is not um, compassionate bumper sticker. I also have another one. Good medicine requires freedom. And freedom is good medicine. The other thing is a, a, a internet friend of mine and someone who sees a patient is a patient and sees a lot of doctors was telling me that she would take a sticky note whenever she had to pay a bill and she would write, "Thank you for your wonderful care. Healthcare is not a right." And um, we came up with the idea of making these little sticky pads, and I have on here the Black Ribbon Project, and um, it's theblackribbonproject.org. Preserving the Doctor-Patient Relationship and Healthcare Freedom. And then for more information, see these organizations like aapsonline.org, docsforpatientcare.org. I mean, this is Vista print. It's really cheap. And if you don't like mine, make your own. But it's, it's a way that whenever you have correspondence, you're saying, I'm for healthcare freedom. Here's where you can go to more um, for more information. And so whenever I'm sending something out that just, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. I just stick something on there, my little note goes with it. One of the most fun things I did this past year was go to the San Jose Tea Party. And it wasn't a doctor's tea party, it was just a tea party. And I wore my white coat and I took a little table, like a folding table, and I set up something and started selling these black ribbons. You cannot believe, I, it was hard for me to be, take myself away from hearing the stories of patients about how much they love their doctors how much they hated Obamacare and they knew it was going to be interfering with them. Go to tea, bar, tea parties, you know, somehow make yourself available to be able to just listen to these heartrending stories and, and motivate people to vote for the right candidates and so forth. But the black ribbon and selling the black ribbon was one of my ways to, to just say, I'm a doctor, I'm for healthcare freedom, and to enter into these conversations with people. Um, there's a conservative uh, forum in San Jose, and I'll be presenting the Black Ribbon Project to them. The reason I'm here is because I read a, an article by Dr. Heeb that I thought was absolutely fabulous, and I just wrote her a thank you letter and stuck in the Black Ribbon um, and my lo a little business card that explained a bit about it, and she said, come tell us about it. It's a simple sim symbol. It's, it's going to be something that people, I think, can identify. And if we can get AAPS to start doing this, Docs for Patient Care is also helping me with this. Um, I'm working with Don, uh, John Dennis on his campaign, and I uh, met Ron Paul, and we'll be sending him a follow-up letter on it. The more we can get this out, and people can, it's, a simple, it's simple, it's little, but it could be really, really powerful. 
But you need to remember you cannot advocate for your patients without advocating for yourself. And do so proudly. And do so with the confidence that we are the ones who speak from true compassion and benevolence. Because without freedom, you can have neither. Thank you.